there was a couple of comments that I will just repeat here before uh, my presentation because it, it really goes to the core of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, mark to market and some accounting concepts, they are very difficult to uh, essentially understand because it's so much uh, internal language, uh, it's so many internal concepts. There are uh, outside of the profession, uh, you hardly ever uh, oversee the full consequences of accounting rules. Uh, it's viewed as boring and nobody outside the profession is really uh, making uh, any deep dives into it. However, I think for investigative journalists, it's also uh, of interest how these things actually is uh, moving through society in waves. Uh, and uh, to those two comments that came before here, I would just like to repeat them. Uh, there was one comment of target the lawmakers. And that's actually very much possible. And I will talk to that later because it's not so that societies are powerless in protecting themselves. It's very much possible to protect yourself, but it needs to have an informed public. And an informed public needs informed journalists that can actually write about the themes. And politicians uh, will not react before there is some kind of uh, argument in the society that some changes should be made. Political changes is made due to that information gets on the table and journalists are very, very important in that aspect. And also uh, Kalle Moone uh, was talking to that institutions that actually politics work. And that what I'm going to show here as part of uh, talking to this uh, mechanism or concept of mark to market. This conference is about looking at complicated uh, matters and mark to market is one of those uh, more complicated things that just lies in the behind everything. It doesn't show up by itself. Uh, so in the financial crisis of 2008, you didn't hear so much about mark to market, uh, but it is a concept that is way deep in the accounting world, which is actually functioning as a roller coaster mechanism in the world economy. Uh, the more you try to uh, to um, regulate part of it, the next financial crisis will become even bigger, uh, and this is uh, something that is. Uh, quite interesting, but also quite dangerous, because then you know that the next crisis will actually have a roller coaster mechanism where the next dive is even deeper. We are talking to the concept that the influence of accounting rules in society, uh, and the question was data and inequality, where are we now? And mark to mark started very easy. It's something that was uh, quite uh, non-influential and not dangerous at all in the beginning. And without tax havens, you would also not have it as a very influential mechanism today. But uh, with tax havens, this becomes a very dangerous concept. In, in the work that we have done in Publisher to Pay Norway, we have looked at which areas are the most dangerous in uh, the concept of, of moving uh, capital, in the concept of uh, trying to take untaxed uh, revenues across borders. Uh, and hide them in tax havens. And we have identified three methods that can actually uh, get you to avoid this. And this is where politics comes in. 
it's not so that politicians are powerless to do something, but they are don't have the knowledge to do it. Um, in this case, uh, we have worked with derivative abuse. Lynn was talking to the explosion of derivatives. Uh, we have worked and are working on capital gains abuse. We have been working on transfer mispricing. We have been working on tax regulation abuse. And what I'm going to talk about now, mark to market mechanisms. Uh, and also redirected income, which is also often called uh, digital business models, where you take transactions across the border. And even though you have all these complexities, don't lose sight of that there is always one thing in the equation that you will find. And it has coined a term a uh, long, long time ago that still works today, and that is follow the money. Everything else is confusion, everything else is a veil, everything else tries to get you to somewhere else, to get you to a result that is not there. So one of the things that we have with respect to, to uh, the methods is that there is actually methods where you can get around all of these issues in, uh, in uh, moving uh, capital and money across the border. What is marked to market? Well, it's the fact, even, even if you have, um, uh, say that you have taken out $100 uh, and you have uh, the exchange rate uh, at the beginning of December and you're then going to the bank and you're putting in and changing the $100 back a month later at another exchange rate. Effectively, mark to market is the concept that you, the bank that sold you the hundred dollar, already knew or estimated what the dollar rate would be when you change it back, and therefore uh, upped their uh, value of the Norwegian krona that you sat with, that they would later convert the dollar that you sold back to them later. So it's a concept where you take an asset, a value, and you uh, you change it to a value that is in the future or today, and it has been unrealized. So for example, if you own a hundred dollars that you got uh, for an exchange rate half a year ago, the company is still owning it. And at the year end, they change it to the exchange rate at the year end. That's extremely normal, done by everybody. And this came, uh, or has always been in accounting. And this is a good system because you actually get monetary assets at the value that you can use them today. So this is the good. Then we have the bad and the ugly. Uh, at some point in time, you started to revalue assets in the balance sheet, particularly when the focus was going over from profit and loss statements and over to balance sheets. Uh, then you started to say that there is a value in the asset in the balance sheet. The focus was not anymore to get a correct profit and loss statement for a business any longer. The focus moved over to get the correct asset value. Well, there is a huge switch in thinking when the accounting rules went that way. And that is that when you focus on a balance sheet asset, then you are talking about future value. You're not talking about the current value. So while profit and loss statements earlier showed the value that had the corporation or the business had accumulated through this year, what happened somewhere during the early 90s and 2005 
whether the focus moved over, and you got to focus on getting the asset value correctly. And that is a huge difference because suddenly businesses got access to values that is actually future values. That means that you revalue the assets in your balance sheet and suddenly the profits that you had through the year is suddenly much, much more worth. Particularly in periods when markets go up, suddenly uh, companies have access to future revenues. And then they start dividending out these future revenues. And suddenly you have this roller coaster mechanism. Then, when the financial crisis comes, the markets go down. Suddenly, you will see uh, businesses that are going into stress situations, possibly going bankrupt, because they have actually dividended future revenues out and have a huge liability which they can't overcome because their, um, their uh, equity is wiped out uh, through uh, market changes. Because if you change, i.e. mark to market, when things are going up, you're also marking to market when things are going down. And things tend to go down pretty fast when they first turn negative. That means that companies can actually, huge corpora corporations, can, in the worst cases, overnight go bankrupt because they don't have the equity anymore, because they have dividended future revenues. This can be market-based. So, for example, exchange uh, rates, uh, interest rates, etc. They can lead to non-realized dividends, but also more dangerous is the fact that you can use models to uh, model uh, the value change. And this uh, was uh, has been done uh, in the past with catastrophic uh, consequences. One of the most um, uh, famous examples is uh, that mark to market was also part of why Enron uh, went bankrupt back in those times and uh, mark to market is is part of why the financial crisis in 2008 uh, actually became so uh, so ugly as as it was the good and the bad uh, that is affecting mostly companies but when you go for the ugly then you also see that it happens on end user transactions that is that every person uh, is affected by this. The ugly is that you co companies take the valuation of all transactions at the margin price. The problem is that this is very quick and material cost increase. While you previously had cost increases due to that the basic factors in producing a service or producing a product changed over time with inflation. This is has nothing to do with inflation. This is that prices changes almost instantly and makes for huge uh, changes in businesses' costs. But also individual people's costs. Again, back to what I said, this would have not been a problem if, if there was not a tax haven in between somewhere. Because then a transaction would go from one country to another, or from one user to another, or from a user to a business, or a business to a business. And it would not have created any issues in the economy. But as soon as you introduce the tax havens in between, so that you accumulate uh, revenues in the tax havens, and leave the cost that is going to be deducted against the business profits still left in the countries, then you suddenly see that profits go to almost zero in, in uh, normal tax countries, and you see a shift of capital over to 
tax havens or low tax jurisdictions at a phenomenal rate. The capital transfer uh, or capital flight uh, that started in, uh, in uh, very small in, in the 50s and 60s and were increasing in the 70s and 80s has exploded in the 90s and uh, the 2000s. And this mechanism here is part of it, but it's almost unknown uh, to people. So the third issue is then pricing depending on purchasing power. This is a problem that creates large uh, systematic uh, problems in countries, econ economies, industries, uh, and at last the world economy. But it, it's on the whole field. It goes from the world economy all the way down to the single user. Uh, you see, as a consequence, large market distortions. You see breakdown of trust. Uh, you see lacking of matching between price and user experience. So, for example, if you look at uh, services, that are based on willingness to pay, not the value for money of the service or, uh, or product. You can take examples like oil service companies uh, uh, let the pricing of their services follow the prices in the oil market or equivalent markets, and they end up being not being competitive when the markets go down. That has happened in Nor Norway. When the, the services and products from the oil service uh, companies became so, uh, so pricey that when oil prices went down, uh, the oil companies could not uh, build new fields anymore uh, because the services going into these platforms, they actually became so uh, so pricey and now when prices have been down for a while the oil, oil service companies have been able to take down the prices significantly in the range of 30% or more but there ain't many oil service companies that have gone bankrupt uh, due to that uh, it's an adjustment that they had to do it was painful when they did it because due to these uh, asset prices uh, etc they had dividended part of their future revenues so in an intermediate period they actually had a very painful time until they were ad able to adjust their cash flows to their uh, accounting uh, readjusted accounting values and then they were able to uh, change their prices down and secure that they were able to live well with uh, much lower prices uh, than previously. In the private area, you see hotels starting to price their services based on willingness to pay, not what is viewed as a fair price for the service by those utilizing the hotel. Um, and this is now coming to online products uh, and services and it's spreading. Uh, one of the items that you see of it is that when you, when you price uh, to the willingness to pay, uh, you see examples in medicine, for example, which we had in news lately, where you see that uh, medicines, uh, due to that uh, Norway is a high cost country, uh, medicine companies are willing to up their pricing far and beyond what the value of each individual medicine is, but it's tied to the willingness to pay. These are just examples. Uh, I'm using these examples because uh, it's easier to understand it, but this goes straight back into the businesses. And this have huge challenges uh, and has an interference with how 
uh, financial institutions and companies are actually able to uh, survive in uh, a downturn in markets. So using then uh, low or no tax jurisdictions, this, this is the change that uh, came about somewhere during the 90s or early 2000s when it became massive. So in the first on the left side you have a markup model where you have uh, uh, a profit element that varies with prices, uh, profit element one, and profit element two is there because you take into account other costs and uh, down payment cost on, on liabilities, so for interest on, on loans, etc. So that's, that's your cost in a prior business model. And if you then were in another country, what you had was uh, operation loans and a markup profit. Uh, this could be any country, normal tax, low tax, doesn't matter. But the difference when you go to mark to market is that you hook on the services that you do from the tax haven. Uh, and now it's not a normal tax jurisdiction, it's normally a tax haven. You hook that onto a market price, say for, for example an oil price in oil and gas industry. And suddenly what you do now is that you move one of the profit elements uh, over from the normal tax jurisdiction to the tax haven. So suddenly your profit going into the tax haven is possibly way beyond what would be considered as any normal profit. And the effect is that what is left then as a profit element in the normal tax jurisdiction is usually a quite low profit and uh, you will see that uh, this is then uh, challenged by other mechanisms, transfer pricing, so that profits can actually almost be eliminated. Is it 10 minutes to end of free and beginning of Fanny? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so what is the problem? Well, used in a company setting, uh, you will see large transfer pricing issues that the tax authorities will never be able to cut through because all comparable transactions are done in the same way. This is not a issue of whether this is tax evasion or tax avoidance or anything like that. This is accounting rules actually changing the way society is, uh, is uh, put together and how society is working. And therefore, that when countries are taking small measures, trying to ensure that this will not have that much effect the next time, what only happens is that you're building a bigger dam you're building a bigger thing that can break. And sometime it breaks. You have heard about the 10-year wave, the 100-year wave, the 1,000-year wave. And what we are actually doing by allowing this to happen is that so society, after the 10-year wave, they are building new defenses, and then comes the 100-year wave and destroys them. And then you build new defenses, but not the right defenses. So then, in order for the dam to break, you need a thousand year wave. And sure enough, sooner or later it comes. So the point is to, to actually take away the entire mechanism ensuring one of the things that we have suggested in this to avoid this roller coaster mechanism is to ensure that uh, these unrealized profits 
you can change the balance sheet uh, with them, but you have to put them in a separate part of the equity where you can't dividend them. That stops the entire building of 10 year, 100 year, 1000 year wave dumps. And the capital from these unrealized profits, they are actually kept in the businesses, financial institutions, other businesses. They are kept in the businesses and they will actually function as a buffer when markets go down because companies have not dividended out uh, these profits earlier than they should. It's a simple but extremely effective mechanism. It will allow investors still to see the value of their assets in the balance sheet of the company, but you will never see these dramatic roller coasting effects in the world economy anymore. And it's an example of how you have to change the way that you are treating the, the defenses against mechanisms like this. This is has nothing to do with tax um, leakage as such, but one of the results is a tax leakage because uh, these, uh, these uh, transactions are being done where the revenue ends up in tax havens. Well, at least uh, you don't have the negative effects that you are losing your buffer in the normal tax jurisdiction. We have, uh, in addition to, to keeping this in a separate uh, part of the equity in order to ensure that you have this buffer in the companies, it's actually also possible to fix the taxation that is coming out of this if there are used uh, tax havens. On the left side here, you have a situation where uh, the current method uh, of taxing leaves, if you have a direct um, uh, investment, for example, from the US to Norway, that results in one taxation, the 260, in this example. Well, if you introduce UK in between here, you still have the same taxation, 260, but if you introduce a tax haven in between here, suddenly you're reducing your tax. Well. One of the possibilities that you have is also to use one of the oldest uh, mechanisms in, in international taxation, uh, the tax uh, credit, which is used to reduce double taxation on uh, revenues. Flip that principle and use it on the cost. Don't allow higher deduction for the cost in a country than the taxes that has been paid on the revenue. By doing that, uh, you will actually see that if you introduce a tax haven or a low tax jurisdiction, it doesn't mean anymore how you have uh, how uh, many uh, subsidiaries uh, you are creating because you always end back in the same tax because you're actually taking the deduction that the company needs in order to get the tax effect. And this is what, I'm talk what I talked about in the beginning. You have to see through the distortions that is being made. You have to see through the complexities and you have to follow the money. Well, where is the money? Well, the revenue is in a tax haven. You can't do anything about that. There will be go years before you have the information. There will be all, s all sorts of uh, complications. There will be a bunch of lawyers involved. And you will never uh, get to the taxation without having an enormous effort and very costly effort. Well, there is another side of that transaction. And that ends up in a normal or high tax jurisdiction. And that is the cost side. And OECD, uh, in their papers, in BEPS, was talking about that countries needed to start to look at the deductions that they gave. 
And this is what the reverse tax credit that we have investigated actually does. It doesn't allow a deduction in the country with normal taxation that is higher than the tax that has been paid worldwide. If you do that, you end up at the exact same taxation. There is a number of benefits of doing this. And since you're targeting only the transactions inside the country, you're actually looking at taking out with surgical precision the negative effects of that revenue moving across borders. That means that you only tax inside the country utilizing a reduction in the uh, a reduction in the deduction uh, and you don't affect any other country's tax system. This is ways how you can actually see through the complexities and see that well governments are not in a situation where they cannot do something. They just don't know what to do. And they need somebody to inform them of what they need to do. That's where you as journalists comes in. This presentation will be available. Uh, I will not talk about every main benefit. There is a simplified example here. And it's also... Uh, information about what information is actually needed in order to uh, start using a mechanism like this and it's very easy. It's a couple of financial numbers from the business in country and it's a couple of uh, information from the financial statement in the overall global uh, financial statement. It's actually very simple but nobody has been chasing these simplified solutions which is targeting the money. Everybody has been focusing on the complexities. If you actually target the money and the part of the money that is sitting in your country, that is the cost side. So you have to do something with the cost side and that is what this mechanism does. Okay, I will stop being free and start being funny. So do you want to have two minute break? Or shall we just carry through? Carry through? Okay. Fanny was going to talk about how these new accounting rules have as an influence on society. <laughs> and which accounting rules are we talking about? Well, it's these same accounting rules that don't focus on historical reporting but calculations based on future revenue potential. They are called in a, a group called fair value adjustments and mark to market is one of these fair value adjustments. So every time you see fair value adjustment you see that you are faced with a corporation which is actually then dividending revenues from future income. The reason why these accounting rules have emerged is that IFRS, which is the organization that uh, is trying to make these rules, focus on these balance sheet values that I talked about, not the profit and loss statement accuracy anymore. The shift happened in Norway in 2005, but it happened elsewhere, UK, US, earlier than this. And fair value accounting, it introduces a very short term perspective and uh, the measurement methods introduces large manipulation opportunities. And these manipulation uh, opportunities that is what is really dangerous because the companies that really want to utilize these mechanisms have a huge possibility to actually increase even further than the mechanisms allows uh, to transfer 
funds between countries. It is very accepted that IFRS actually amplified the financial crisis of 2008, and this is, this is what I'm talking about, that you, you have to stop as policymakers to try to make these dams and to have to try to approach this in a totally different manner. This is an example Fanny took out, which the consequences of moving the hospitals in Norway, or one of them, to the accounting law. Well, in the individual uh, hospital, the total balance sheet was 13.8 uh, billion. In the group financial statements, the same was 21.3 billion. Uh, sorry, million. No, oh, billion, it's 1,000 kroner. So the difference is almost seven and a half billion. And what has then been observed is that due to the new accounting rule for hospitals, the hospitals suddenly went from a profit situation to a deficit situation due to increased depreciation and increased focus on revenues and privatization. So the use of the accounting law for hospitals meant new calculated and higher values on public property. So when you then introduce depreciation on this, it actually appears as if public services as a result is expensive, while they are not as expensive because the, uh, you have suddenly introduced a depreciation element that was not there before. The hospital is all paid for and therefore uh, there is no cash element associated with that deficit for that hospital. Um, and research show, I don't have the link to it, but research show that there would have been no deficit in the hospital accounts if the system of accounting had not been changed. And this is sort of a reflection of that society allows these accounting rules to be introduced further and wider uh, all the time. But they are not taking into account that policymakers actually have the possibility to counteract negative effects like this. As I said previously, these hospitals have been paid for. There is no cash effect of these deficits that was shown in this example here. There is a further example uh, where uh, it is demonstrated in the same hospital that if you see the accounting result on the top line, it shows a negative, uh, a deficit all the time. But if you then look at what would happen if you used the old accounting rules, they would have actually shown a profit in that. You have some of the same effects when you uh, force accounting rules, which was done on the pension level, which essentially, uh, after the change in accounting in 2005, you almost, uh, most benefit plans that was previously, previously giving employees a good pension was replaced by contribution plans. This is also a result of the same type of accounting changes that was done uh, in Norwegian law back in 2005. Again, quite dramatic effects for individual people, quite dramatic effects for businesses, uh, and it's not only the other assets that change the accounting for the hospitals, also these pension uh, um, changes uh, made this. Fanny has further examples of how this affects uh, defense forces. Again, uh, public uh, institutions where all the uh, assets has been paid down, but it's actually uh, the defense forces is showing a deficit because they are now actually starting to write it. Luckily, this was played down by the 
or changed by the Minister of Defense at the time, but there are still effects for the defense forces. So all this, which started very easily as a change in accounting rules, is spreading and spreading and taking uh, more and more uh, effect. And as it takes effect, you're also uh, seeing growing inequality. Of course, we are not saying that all inequality comes from an accounting rule. That would be ridiculous. But it's part of the total picture, an equality that do didn't need to be there. Because you're actually taking future revenues and dividending, and you're moving capital into tax havens, which you didn't need to. So this is effects that is coming on top of the in inequality that we already have in society. We have more than enough inequality to work if we don't need to fight the counting rules uh, as well. So there is a few other examples of research that has been done which is confirming this. But um, uh, I think the point has been made. Accounting rules do matter and they are sometimes giving rise to possibly very unexpected results which most people are totally unaware of and as journalists uh, we think that it's beneficial that, that the journalist uh, environment is aware of these effects because some of them can explain some of the behavior in companies uh, some of them can explain why uh, financial crisis uh, becomes so problematic to handle for the authorities because they are using the wrong means. They are, they are uh, putting up money for financial institutions uh, like they did in the US while they could have changed a rule of how you treat this in the equity and made sure that the financial institutions could not dividend these funds before they were actually realized. I think I will stop there. Thank you.